So, thanks for coming. And thanks for whoever bought the cake. That's a great, that's a great move. Um, yeah, so I'm going to sort of brush over some stuff in fairly broad sort of brush strokes. Um, I'm not going to go into too much fine detail today. I've been told that um, sort of uh, that not many of you probably be biologists. So if you're a biologist, you want to... Okay. <laughs> right, so we've got, got one at the back, so that's good. Um, so I, I'm going to talk sort of fairly broad terms. So this is um, taken straight from the British Heart Foundation website. <clears throat> So if you type in, how does cigarette smoke uh, give, cause heart disease, this is what it comes up with. So it increases the, the risk of cardiovascular disease, including coronary uh, heart disease and stroke. And it damages the lining of your arteries that leads to build up a fatty material, or atheroma, which narrows the artery. And this can cause a heart attack or stroke. Heart, obviously, heart attack uh, is in the heart, stroke in the brain. Um, and then they go on to define a couple of other things that might... Uh, sort of influences process, the first being carbon monoxide, um, <clears throat> which reduces the ability of your red blood cells to carry oxygen around your body, and the second being nicotine, which raises your blood pressure. And obviously just having a constantly uh, raised blood pressure is a, a major sort of component of, uh, sort of progression towards heart disease. <clears throat> um, and the last one, which actually becomes more obvious why this is important, um, is that when you smoke, your, your blood actually clots a lot more quickly. And why that's important becomes obvious in just a few minutes. But I've put a massive black box around this first one because actually the mechanism by which this actually happens is very poorly defined. So how smoking damages the lining of your arteries is really um, almost unknown. There's very, very few experiments done to actually try and determine it. So if we start here at the top, so we've got smoking, uh, so that damages the artery wall. That leads to the build-up of atherosclerosis in the arteries, uh, and atherosclerosis uh, can go on to give you a heart attack. So the reason it's, it's a bit of a black box is really because there's about a uh, sort of conservative estimate, 4,000 different chemicals, maybe as many as eight or 9,000 different chemicals in cigarette smoke. <clears throat> and it's quite likely that the way that this damages the artery wall is a combination or a a synergistic action of a lot of these different things all happening at the same time. So people don't generally don't try and dissect that out. We're just trying to keep it all together as cigarette smoke and uh, deal with it together. So the way it damages the artery wall, um, first off, um, is the cells that line the artery, and these are called endothelial cells, um, and they function in many different ways to actually regulate vascular um, function. And I'll, I'll mention some of those in a minute. So actually damaging the way that these cells behave um, is what helps to promote the whole process of atherosclerosis. So atherosclerosis, a uh, long word, two halves. Athero is sort of fat, uh, fatty deposits. And the sclerosis is a fibrous material that encase, tries to encase it. So you end up developing atherosclerosis. And the way that this leads to a heart attack um, is either through the, the plaques rupturing or eroding, and I'll cover that in just a second. Um, but this damage to the artery wall in, in the presence of atherosclerosis can sort of directly lead to a heart attack uh, if you damage the endothelial cells. So I'm going to pause there on smoking for a minute and just talk a little bit about atherosclerosis, just to sort of fill in a few uh, blanks so that we can sort of move on a little bit. <clears throat> so it's, it's known that a lot of the risk factors for atherosclerosis are systemic, so things like uh, diabetes or smoking, um, or having uh, a poor diet, obviously not doing enough exercise, that affects large uh, amounts of your arteries. But the atherosclerosis doesn't develop just randomly, it develops in very defined places. So it actually starts to develop where you have branch points uh, and where you have curvature in the artery. And that suggests that the sort of hemodynamics, the, the, the blood flow pattern, uh, plays a role in the development of atherosclerosis. So what I've got here is if you'll put your two fingers against your carotid. Let's see if you're still awake. Okay, you can feel the pulse. That's your carotid artery. Hopefully you can feel the pulse. If not, you're in trouble. Um, right, so it branches about, about the top here, just underneath your chin, into the uh, internal and external carotid artery. So this is um, a reconstruction of the blood flow in that branch point. And what you can see is that the forward moving blood in this, in this video is in red. And anything that's not going forward, so any, anything that's reversing or sideways is in blue. 
And you can see that this section of artery here, hopefully you can just see the lights, it's all red. So this, this section of artery is only getting blood flow that's moving in the forward direction. And again, here at the top, it's all moving in the forward direction. But here at the bifurcation, um, at some point of the, the, the cardiac cycle, it really moves forwards. So, dive. <laughs> Just at the point where I needed to work. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, oh, there you go. So you can see it all goes red for a, for a second, and then it goes blue. So what actually happened is that the blood's going forward during the main pulse, uh, and then... Um, as you get some sort of regurgitation, it's actually bouncing backwards and going in different directions. And it turns out that you only get atherosclerosis where you get this kind of blood flow. So the question therefore is why? why? Why do you get atherosclerosis here? And that kind of points the finger directly at these cells, which are the endothelium, which I've already measured, already mentioned. Maybe can I turn these front lights off? Does that work? So we've got a nice... <coughs> I'd better stand in front of the microphone. A nice scanning electron uh, micrograph of uh, the inside of an artery. And the first thing you can hopefully notice is that the endothelial cells here all line up with the direction of flow. Um, and this is a branch point here, and you can see that the endothelial cells sort of curve off and go around the corner. And this is because the endothelial cells themselves sense their mechanosensitive. Okay, so they, set, they sense the stretch with every pulse, and they turn that into a biochemical signal. And they also sense the, the flow over the top of them, and turn that into a biochemical signal as well. So f the, the flow, or the shear stress, this frictional force of flowing blood over the top of the endothelial cells, dramatically affects the way they behave. Uh, I'm actually going to skip that one. Okay. Right, so um, when you have a nice straight piece of artery, you get nice laminar blood flow. And this gives a certain uh, behavior for endothelial cells. And this is sort of a quiescent. It's a sort of redu reduced inflammation, uh, reduced reactive oxygen species production. It reduces the permeability, which is important, um, and it increases the bioavailability of nitric oxide. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, whereas in the disturbed region, it, if there's any sort of anything that causes inflammation, it responds much more aggressively. Uh, they have more reactive oxygen species production and they're more permeable. Now the reason that's important is you have cholesterol floating around in your body, in your bloodstream. Uh, every cell needs cholesterol, so it's transported to the cell in these molecules called, um, uh, these uh, protein uh, lipid uh, vesicles called uh, LDL. So there's low density lipoproteins. So if you have an increase in permeability, you can actually let more of this LDL into the artery wall. And so here, where it's more permeable, you get more LDL filtering in and it gets trapped in the matrix and that actually helps to kick this whole uh, process of atherosclerosis off. And uh, this is a longitudinal section, a longer human coronary artery which I did. And what you can see here is in this nice straight region of artery, uh, you get almost no disease going to be in the here, but actually where you get this bifurcation, uh, you start to get this fatty deposit in the artery wall and then this fibrous material over the top trying to hold it all in. So hopefully you, you can see that um, the way that endothelial cells behave directly affects the development of atherosclerosis. But the atherosclerosis itself isn't the thing that gives you a heart attack. It, it's sort of the seed bed. And the thing that actually uh, potentially kills you is uh, one of these two things. It's either plaque rupture or plaque erosion. So plaque rupture, what you've got here... Stand in the way. So this was where that fatty deposit was in the artery wall. And this was that fibrous material over the top. And what you can see is that the fibrous material is, this died as well, um, fibrous material is, is broken at this point and let the fat out. The blood's then got into this space and formed a blood clot. And you can see that that's sort of progressed out into the artery. And if that completely blocks up the artery, then no blood then gets to the heart muscle. The heart muscle gets starved and stops working and you end up with a heart attack. So about three quarters of heart attacks are caused by this, this process of plaque rupture, where the fibrous cap eventually gets too thin and gives up. Um, the other sort of quarter, or thereabouts, um, is caused by this process called plaque erosion. And uh, what you have here is you've got this very thick fibrous cap, and this is very typical of the plaques that erode. Uh, there is a fatty core, but that's buried down deep within the plaque, so that's never going to rupture. Um, but what you've got here, you can see by the different layering of the thrombus is that, and also if you stain for endothelial cells, the endothelial cells are here are missing. 
Uh, so the endothelial cells have fallen off, and that's exposed the collagen in the artery wall. And that, again, has, has sort of triggered a blood clot. And the blood clot here has filled up the artery and therefore stopped the blood going to the heart, uh, heart muscle, and the heart has stopped. And obviously, they died of this particular uh, event. So, um, as I mentioned, uh, endothelial erosion is where the endothelial cells fall off. Um, accounts for about a quarter of heart attacks and there's no consistent association with inflammatory cells and so we assume it's a predominantly endothelial pathology uh, so it's mainly about endothelial cells um, and uh, if you look at the plaques they generally all have a large degree of narrowing so the blood flows down moving very fast and that changes the way the cells behave um, and they all have this thick fibrous cap right so going back to smoking, why am I interested in smoking? So this is why you might be interested uh, if you work on smoking. It's because the, the people who are more likely to suffer from this kind of heart attack are generally uh, smokers, um, generally uh, female and generally younger. Uh, so sort of the frequency of people dying, or people who die of a heart attack who have had an erosion, if they're sort of 40 to uh, 55 year old women, it's more than half of them have died of an erosion rather than a plaque rupture. Right, okay, uh, so a little bit of science. I'm going to whiz through this pretty quick. Okay, um, so we've got these different ways the cells behave. So we have uh, in normal shear stress, they're sort of happy, for want of a better word, to be completely anthropomorphic. Um, so they have this protective antioxidant, uh, anti inflammatory phenotype. Uh, under oscillatory shear, they're, they're activated, they, they respond more to um, pro inflammatory stimuli. And then we have this elevated shear in the middle over the top of the plaque and that's a bit of a black box no one really knows how they behave there so that's really what we set off to try and understand because it's the cells here that erode it's the cell, they fall off here where the, the plaque is stenotic okay um right so this, these different ways they behave are actually coordinated by a number of different transcription factors. Now these are, are proteins that track to the nucleus and turn genes on and turn genes off. Um, and so the, the protective phenotype is, is really controlled by a couple of transcription factors. The first being KLF2, this partner KLF4, um, or his family member KLF4. Also uh, the antioxidant response is controlled by a transcription factor called NRF2. Um, there's been a lot of work on this, and uh, really just to summarise, I'm going to actually skip that one and go to the next slide. To summarise uh, an awful lot of data, what you have here is this is the aortic arch as it comes out the top of the heart, and it's got sort of uh, a simulation of the, the, the way that the blood moves. So here in the nice straight piece of artery, oh, it's died completely. Okay. So here, uh, where it's nice and straight, um, you don't get any disease. On the outside curvature here, you don't get any disease, but on the inside, you start to get plaque formation. And so what people have done is that they've taken one aorta and sort of opened it up and stained it uh, for different things. So one of them is actually this transcription factor NRF2. And what this slide shows is that actually most of the NRF2 is in the nucleus on the protective, on the outer curvature. Whereas on the inner curvature where you can get atherosclerosis, a lot of the NRF2 is in the cytoplasm. Okay, I'll just explain that just a little bit more. Right, now I'll put this up for effect rather than for you to understand everything that's on this slide. Um, so NRF2 is this transcription factor and it's kept in the cytoplasm of the cell by binding to this protein KEEP1. So KEEP1 keeps it in the cytoplasm and when uh, either uh, reactive oxygen species or other things such as shear stress activate it, uh, it's split from KEEP1, and then NRF2 can track into the nucleus, bind the DNA at the antioxidant response element, and turn on genes. Okay, so that's the way it works. But it's not quite as simple as that, because it competes for the binding site with BAC1 within the nucleus. It also, uh, the KEEP1 can be shuttled into the nucleus uh, through another binding partner, and uh, GSK3-beta, which is a, a, a intracellular kinase, can phosphorylate this kinase signaling cascade that phosphorylates NRF2 and can shunt it back out of the nucleus. Okay. Now, you may not have understood any of that, but the, there is one point that's actually quite striking, which you can maybe take. If this was just a good thing, you would expect it just to be switched on. And none of this 
to actually happen. Okay. So while we think antioxidant response, that's a good thing. We like antioxidants. We have them in our fruit juices and everything else, and everyone thinks that's a good thing. This protein that actually regulates the whole antioxidant response is very tightly regulated. Now, if NRF2 was just a good thing, then selective pressures would have made that none of this would actually happen, and that this would just be made, go into the nucleus, and switch on a bunch of genes which help to protect us from oxidant stress. And because all of this actually exists, it begs the question, what is the downside to this antioxidant response? Surely there has to be one, otherwise none of that would exist. Does that make sense? You want to with me? That's good. Right, okay. So uh, just a few details on some of our experiments. So we actually grow endothelial cells um, on glass slides, and then we assemble this whole rig. And this rig allows us to pass media in one side, across the cells, and then back out the other side. And this allows us to simulate any kind of blood flow pattern that we like. Uh, and so we, we, we simulate these three types of blood flow pattern, uh, the first being oscillatory shear, as if it was a bifurcation. Then we have our normal shear, it's in a nice straight piece of artery. And then we have elevated shear. And um, that simulates the blood flow over the top of the plaque. In rough term. Uh, the, the other thing that we make, one of the things we make is uh, cigarette smoke extract. And we take a very simplistic approach to this. Uh, we actually burn a single uh, low tar cigarette, which is a Marlboro light. Um, we take the filtered smoke, so this is actually what someone would breathe in, and we bubble it through some tissue culture media. And we use that uh, to put onto ourselves. Uh, so we do this in such a way that about half of the smoke is drawn through the media and it's drawn through in about five minutes so we try to do something that is it's not the same as smoking a cigarette I'm quite aware of that but it's not a, 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 it's, 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 it's a sort of a sensible approach okay I'll leave it at that okay so about half the smoke is bubbled through uh, in about five minutes so we, we set the pump at a constant rate to allow that to happen and we then filter this and dilute that down and put it on ourselves um, sort of back of the cigarette packet calculation, it'd be approximately similar by the time you calculate someone's blood volume to someone smoking about 60 a day. So it's, 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 a, good, it's a good dose of cigarette smoke extract, um, but it's not, uh, it's not wildly beyond, it's not like it's 4,000 cigarettes. Or something like that. Okay, so our experiments, uh, quite uniquely what we do is we set our flow rig up and then we actually culture the cells for a full 24 hours before we start putting anything on and that allows the cells to adjust to their environment because actually during that first 24 hours they actually line up and they uh, turn they change their cytoskeleton they change all of their um, gene expression uh, to, to basically sort of become adapted to their flow environment and we use human coronary artery endothelial cells so they're actually cells straight from cell apart um, so they're about as good as we can get, really. Uh, so we, we culture them under three, three different shear stresses. There's a control, there's a, an inflammatory cytokine, which we use TNF-alpha, which is a, a sort of a fairly typical inflammatory cytokine. Um, it has quite a large effect on endothelial cells. Then we use our cigarette smoke extract, and then we use the combination of inf inflammation and cigarette smoke. And the reason we do that is because... Uh, when people smoke quite heavily, you get a lot of inflammation in the lung, and actually you get measurable amounts of uh, things like TNF-alpha in the bloodstream. So we're really trying to sort of simulate that sort of combined effect of having smoked for a period of time. So when we actually did this, uh, we, we did a whole gene array to actually look at the, the genes which are affected by cigarette smoke. And then we, what we can do is look in their promoters to see what transcription factors are turning those genes on and off. And one of the, the slightly more surprising things is that the NRF2, this protective system that we're expecting um, to be slightly switched on by shear stress, is actually also very much strong, very strongly switched on by cigarette smoke. Actually, when you look in the literature, this is something that people have noted in animal models. So if you look in the mice, in the lungs from mice that have been exposed to cigarette smoke, uh, NRF2 is actually switched on. So this is uh, maybe not a, a great surprise. So we went on and had a look at some of the genes that are regulated by NRF2. So this is a hemoxygenase 1, and um, it produces carbon monoxide by uh, catalyzing heme groups. 
And that carbon monoxide is actually um, used as a signaling molecule within endothelial cells and also endothelial cells to the, the other cells in the artery wall. Um, and actually, it, it's, it's, it's pre predominantly anti-inflammatory, right, and also protective. So um, what you can see here, and it doesn't matter which shear stress you look at, when you add cigarette smoke, you get a very strong induction of humoxygenase 1. And actually, when you look under laminar shear or even elevated shear, uh, the induction is even stronger, and there's a synergism between cigarette smoke and inflammation. So inflammation on its own doesn't turn the genes on, but when you have cigarette smoke and inflammation, this system is pushed extremely hard. Um, so the, the protective effects of NRF2 with flow uh, are really seen here. So you've got control and laminar. So they go up maybe 50%. So a bit more NRF2 is a good thing. But now we're actually getting an, an awful lot of NRF2 activity. Again, I'm not expecting you to take the detail in on this, um, really just the shape of it. So uh, if you look at the shape of this graph, and then look at the shape of all of these graphs, these are other NRF2 regulated genes. So we're not basing all of our um, conclusions just on the, the regulation of one gene. So again, you can see that um, Cigarette smoke induces these genes, and there's a, a synergism between cigarette smoke and inflammation. Right, so this all says that NRF2, this antioxidant protective uh, system, is very highly switched on by cigarette smoke extract. So what actually does this do uh, to our endothelial cells? So what we've done here is we've used an adenovirus, which is a sort of gene transfer vector, to overexpress NRF2. And this floods the cell with NRF2, um, and sort of overwhelms the, the, the mechanism that keeps it in the cytoplasm, so it goes into the nucleus and switches on a whole bunch of NRF2 regulated genes. And what we've done here is either use uh, um, a constitutively active NRF2 or a dominant negative NRF2. And what we've found is that actually both of these uh, stop the endothelial cells from proliferating. And if you stop the cells from proliferating, you stop the ability to repair damage. Uh, it's one of the sort of consequences of this. So it, it, there's a bit of a knife edge. Um, if you don't have enough NRF2, that's a bad thing. But also if you have too much NRF2, too much of this antioxidant uh, system, that's also a bad thing. You want somewhere in the middle. Okay. Right. Um, so the last little bit of data, and I'm running out of time. Okay. So uh, these are endothelial cells. Unfortunately, you probably have to get a bit closer to really see this. Uh, what you have under a ciliary shear, they sort of have this nice cobblestone effect. Uh, they look they look very nice. Uh, when you have laminar shear, you can see, hopefully, can you see that they've all lined up? Uh, so they've all lined up with the direction of flow, and the elevated shear the same. Um, I'm just going to draw your attention to this last box. So when you put TNF and cigarette smoke on, the cells uh, start to fall off. It's probably, can you just about see that? Okay, I apologise, these are small pictures. Um, so we're actually starting to recapitulate in tissue culture the effects that we see in people. So people who smoke and have inflammation are more prone to erosions. And in tissue culture, what we can start to do is to sort of mimic some of this by putting the inflammation and the cigarette smoke back on our cells. But it's a, a flow-dependent effect. So it, it's all built in with the way they, they react to flow. So what we have here, we've got our elevated shear control. So this is with no, uh, nothing else added. And then when we add uh, TNF and cigarette smoke, we start to see the cells detach. This is a, a graph of cell number. So we've put a whole lot of different chemicals on to try and probe this process, to try and work out why they're falling off. And one of the things we put on are activators of this NRF2 system. Um, but rather than actually protect from falling off, what we actually find is it actually makes the whole thing worse. So this really puts the spotlight on this antioxidant response as uh, why uh, cigarette smoke is potentially causing these heart attacks. And that, really, that's as far as I'm going to sort of present you with sort of hard data. I'm, uh, I'm running out of time. So just to summarize, uh, shear stress activates this antioxidant response, this NRF2 target gene expression. And uh, sorry, shear stress activates it a little bit. And actually, that's a good thing. But then cigarette smoke comes and actually pushes the, uh, the, the system up right to pretty much near maximum. And when you actually have any kind of inflammation in there, this synergizes to push the system even harder. Okay. 
Um, and if you actually modulate the NRF2 system, it prevents the cells from proliferating and re potentially repairing, and it also makes them fall off, uh, which could trigger a heart attack if it was in inside of it. So that's why we think that a sustained high-level activation of this antioxidant system is actually a bad thing rather than uh, being a good thing. And it's why smoking might actually start to cause heart attacks, at least part of the mechanism of why it causes a heart attack. Uh, I've got maybe just two or three minutes just to say uh, a little bit more about what we're actually going to be doing um, over the next couple of months. Uh, so I guess you recognise both of these people. Uh, so uh, with, with Nick and obviously Prime Minister Marcus Manifo. Um, so uh, what we're actually looking at is uh, something F2RL3. I did change that. I've, I think I've lost one version of my uh, this talk. So F2RL3 is uh, a gene which is hypomethylated in smokers. And we also see uh, we, a couple of bits of data just to show that we see a similar effect in tissue culture. So um, if a gene is, uh, if DNA is methylated, it tends to switch the gene expression down, switch it off, reduce gene expression. Um, and uh, the PAR4 gene, or the F2RL3 gene, uh, is hypomethylated in smokers, therefore you do expect more expression. So what we see is that inflammation increases uh, PAR4 expression, and cigarette smoke compared to the control also increases it. And this is a shear dependent effect. So here at elevated shear, where we uh, think that the cells are most likely to fall off um, in an erosion. Um, what you can see is that cigarette smoke robustly activates uh, PAR4 gene expression. And again, there's some synergy between TNF and uh, cigarette smoke, so between inflammation and, and, um, and smoking. Uh, one, two other little snippets of data. Um, in our endothelial cells, if you put a drug on that actually inhibits uh, the methylases that, that methylate um, DNA. So this is a, a DNMT1, a predominant DNMT1 inhibitor. Uh, what we find is if we put this on our cells, it switches on uh, um, PAR4 expression. And we also see that uh, DNMT1 is slightly downregulated by cigarette smoke. So putting this all together, it means that we actually have a tissue culture system that potentially mirrors some of the effects that we see in, in people. And uh, Jack is uh, working with uh, Marcus and Nick over the next couple of months. We're going to produce some samples and look at the methylation state of the DNA and see if we actually have a platform that we can start to dissect with some of this mechanism. Uh, yeah, I'm going to skip over that. Might as well skip over it. Right, so these, these, these are um, some of the other things that we work on. Actually, cigarette smoke, uh, interestingly, seems to inhibit some, some pathways of inflammation. And there is some clinical data that suggests that things like... Um, uh, colitis, ent enterocolitis, not enterocolitis uh, inflammation in the, in the gut is actually very rare in smokers. There is actually some pathway which smoking seems to inhibit the inflammation in intestine. And we seem to actually uh, find similar things in our endothelial cells. So uh, this is actually on a log scale because these gene expression changes are so big. So we have a control here and then the expression of VCAM goes up about 40 fold when you put TNF on. So this uh, adhesion molecule that endothelial cells express massively turned up by inflammation. However, cigarette smoke actually reduces its expression and can, can actually abolish the upregulation that TNF puts on. Uh, we actually have a mechanism that we're working on to try and explain this as uh, through competition of cofactors from the, within the nucleus. I'm not really going to present any of that. Uh, we're interested in uh, other things that might make the endothelial cells stick to the artery wall. And this is a, um, a protease inhibitor that we've worked on and are about to publish this um, about how uh, shear stress upregulates this to help them stick on as the blood flow gets harder, it helps them stick down. Um, but it's downregulated by inflammation and therefore may be part of the whole process of why they fall off. Um, the last thing just to mention is that we have a very large uh, biobank. I've been amassing this now for about five years. So we have about 320 donors. Uh, we, we collect donor material, so we have about 80 or 90 smokers. Um, these are all cause death. And so if you want to come and look at what smoking is doing, you can actually match up coronary arteries from smokers versus non-smokers to either disease sections or even non-disease sections, and actually come back and look at um, 
lots of things. So we could make DNA extracts to look at methylation, or we can look at gene expression for things like PAR4 and, and so on. So we actually have this large biobank of human material, which we can use. Uh, and um, lastly, uh, with, uh, with one of my clinical colleagues, uh, we've been looking at, at actually um, advancing some of the um, imaging modalities that you can use in people to try and actually look inside people's arteries out. So what this is is a um, OCT image of someone's artery. So this is the artery wall out here. And uh, all of this is plaque material. And it uses infrared to look in from the inside of the artery. So obviously this is, this is a, uh, an invasive uh, procedure where uh, usually at the time of angioplasty they can actually pass this, this probe up, up through the groin up to the heart and actually look inside the arteries to see what actually is going on. So we've been doing a lot of work with Tom on that. Right, okay, so I'll, I'll leave it there, because um, I've, I've had my half an hour, and uh, open it up for questions if anyone's got any.